Welcome Rockers, I am Artifacts and these are the Launchpad Live Interviews. In 2011, on the 10th season of American Idol, James Durbin from Santa Cruz, California burst onto the scene destined to bring metal to the mainstream. After finishing fourth in the competition and having several successful solo records and a stint in Quiet Riot from 2017 to 2019, James Durbin is back with a brand new self-produced band record called Durbin The Beast Awakens. He continues to be an inspiration for those who battle disabilities such as Tourette's and autism. I sat down with James to talk about his journey from 2011 till now. This is the unedited interview with James Durbin. This is James Durbin of the band Durbin, and you are getting your metal fixation on 99 WNRR. Hey, everybody. I'm here with James Durbin. James, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> very good. Very good. Let's get right into it. Um, let's talk about the new record because this is... Um, a departure for you in a way, but yet it goes all the way back to your roots uh, in your days to Hollywood Scars. And what gave you the inspiration and, and why go back to, uh, you know, the roots of metal? Well, after I had uh, made my departure from QR, the first email in my inbox was from Frontiers and uh, they were interested in continuing to make music together. Um, I had done uh, three albums uh, with my time in QR, we did Road Rage. We did uh, One Night in Milan, where I met everybody from Frontiers out in Milan, Italy. And then we did, um, uh, what's the other one? Hollywood Cowboys. And so, you know, having made those albums with Frontiers, um, they knew what I was capable of. I asked them, you know, what what kind of album do you guys want me to make? Because, you know, that's kind of the usual with with labels. They're they're kind of after uh, what they want. Yeah. And instead they replied and said, well, we want to know what kind of album you want to make. <laughs> I was like, oh, I found yeah. my label family right here. Yeah. And, it you know, it just happened to line up together with uh, with what they wanted to do with me. It wasn't what they what they wanted me to do. It was what they had in mind. And that was exactly what I had told them was a classic 80s power slash, you know, just classic metal. And uh, along the lines of Dio and Priest and, and a little Maiden in there and a lot of Sabbath, Dio Sabbath, Tony Martin Sabbath. Yeah. And uh, there's there's this specific weight that that type of music has. The type of music that Ronnie James Dio made and performed or his band made or, or whoever was behind the writing of, of the songs themselves. But that sound and the performance that followed and, and how he kept that sound going throughout all the years, that's the specific sound that that i uh equate with um classic metal and um is one of my favorites and but it's also something that i don't hear being continued or replicated um in in this day and age of metal and um uh, if you found any please direct me to it because i'm hungry for it but i thought hell why not just write it myself why not try that uh, try my hand at that myself yeah 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 and in listening to this uh and listening to this record um prince of metal i i was almost like holy cow there's a there's a slight tip of the cap to i think iron maiden in that song sounds very familiar to uh, to uh, phantom of the opera you, you know i i keep hearing references being made to phantom and i keep going back and listening to it yeah. and the only thing that i can figure out is maybe tempo and that initial chug but yeah, my, the, the, the cadence yeah. of that. Yeah, I which think. which was which was not <laughs> it was not on purpose. But what I keep uh, going back to is, you know, there's only so many tempos that feel right, and there's really only twelve notes to choose from in the traditional music sense. You know, it's a uh, hell awesome. <laughs> it's Maiden. Who cares? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Why not? In this record, what was the process and the concept of building the Beast Awakens and? Uh, you know, the Prince of Metal. Uh, take me through the process on, on, on how this whole um, experience in this record was built. Well, to begin with, um, when it first started was just before the pandemic hit. So I had reached out to different songwriters and my plan was to write with different people. Um, and then the pandemic hit and all that got squashed. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to write this record myself. I'm going to write this album myself. A hundred percent. I'm going to write every riff. Why not? I've never written riffs that much before. Mm -hmm. um, but who's to say that I can't, you know, pull something out of my ass and figure it out. That's what everybody does. It <laughs> Music exists somewhere somewhere. It's got to exist somewhere. 
where are we pulling these songs from? Where are these songs coming from? These melodies and these uh, riffs and these lyrics. And so I, I knew at the beginning that I didn't want to write another album about me. My previous albums, Memories of a Beautiful Disaster, Celebrate, yeah. even Riot on Sunset, and, and Homeland, especially my last one, which was an Americana album, for fuck's sake. I mean, like, it's crazy to, to, to think of them that way, but they're very, those are very personal albums. And this album is very personal as well, but it's, I was able to give those experiences to a fictional character, the Prince of Metal himself. I was able to give him a backstory. I was able to give him an emotional, an emotional pull. Um, and and write his hero arc, write his story arc. And that's been really important to me uh, for the development of this album and writing it and writing his story. And it's it's made it a lot more fun in that way because I don't have to keep writing about, about me. Um, but also I can dip into things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to write about or talk about and wrap them up in, in him. Were you able to completely separate yourself from the character to write from his point of view or does some of you still exist in the character? I mean, yeah, def- I mean, he, he is me in a sense. But I'm not him. I'm not the Prince of Metal. <laughs> no, uh, if someone asks, who is the Prince of Metal? I'd say, yes, yes. Who, who definitely is the Prince of Metal? Um, point me to him when you meet him. But yeah, I'm, he is me. I am not him. There's different things in different songs. I mean, the Prince of Metal is, the song itself is taking a event, a series of events, and putting them into a fantasy world. It's like, you know, his heart in a roar and his hands together on his face. He's in a position where he's, you know, at a crossroads in life. He doesn't know what to do. And and uh, um, the heavens suddenly had opened the answer to all of his praise. And it, and it seems like this thing is the answer to all of his prayers. But in the blink of an eye, the angel had burst into flames. And in the echoing madness, they grabbed him and dragged him away. You know, yeah. in the twisting of steel and the slice of a blade, you know, there's a separation there. The fall of the kings of the land will long be remembered. You got to remember those that have come before you, especially in the metal space and, and making a classic metal album. I have to somehow put myself into that age, uh, put myself into the 80s. So then I would have been influenced by the bands from the 50s through the 70s. And then who were my peers at that time? And who are the other bands in, you know, in my genre space and make music that uh, appeals to their audiences as well and uh, also forges my own, you know, musical path as well. What um, I'm curious, what is one of the things that uh, was the most eye opening to you uh, getting into this business uh, on this level from the beginning of uh, memories up until your time with uh, QR? Uh, I would be. After I did my second album, Celebrate. So my first album was a, you know, a radio rock album. Yeah. And then I went to Nashville and wrote for three months with one of my favorite songwriters, uh, uh, James Michael, uh, singer of the band 6AM. And I got to work one-on-one with him and pick his brain on songwriting and his, like his note scale that he chooses from and where you think that he would sing one thing. He sings, he goes in, you know, takes it to a, from a major to a minor, a lot of that stuff. And, and yeah. just these really, really nice sonically nice sound sounds and phonetics phonetics and lyrics and um but after that uh i took those songs to the label and they decided that they wanted to go in a different direction and pitched a pop album and it's like the uh it's like the story of uh, Rock of Ages. You know, they get the the young rocker and then they uh, tell him all these things and they dress him up and then they say, all right, boy, we're turning you pop. You know, ditch the bandana. Are you married to the bandana? Well, I got married wearing a bandana. That was an actual conversation uh, with, <laughs> with, with, with the record label in my past. And, so and yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. But in, and, but at that point, you know, you take things as a challenge and gain wisdom if you don't interact, if you don't engage and, and um, wisdom comes from experience and, and each of these things and, and these bands and these records and everything is a different experience and a different opportunity to gain wisdom. And so after that album, you know, it, it, it performed to whatever success it performed to. And um, I got out of my record deal with uh, my old record label, Wind Up Records. And, and then I was independent and being independent really, really opened my eyes to uh, if I really wanted to continue to do this or not. Because once there's nobody to point fingers at and there's no one 
one to blame but yourself and there's no one that's going to get it done other than you, then that's the real test of like, okay, I've got no team anymore. I've got, you know, uh, I'm, we're self-managing in-house. We're doing promotion in-house. I'm designing merch and we're getting it printed and selling it ourselves and packaging every envelope and sending everything out. And then to the record making, I'm writing every song. I'm co-producing. You know, what, what, this all falls on me now. It, it's not pointing fingers at A&R. It's not pointing fingers at label and producers and, and all these people that are, you know, manipulating it. And so that's really where I learned the most. And I, I carry that with me even till today, even though I'm with a label again, uh, I'm with a label that has trust in me and has faith in me to deliver. And that makes all the difference because um, they're trusting that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's uh, you just as long as I'm having fun, I'm going to keep uh, keep doing it. And there's been instances and occasions and experiences where you stop having fun and you got to stop doing it at that point because it's there's no point in beating a dead horse and uh and and still trying to ride it yeah 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 very true um you know when i think about the beast awakens you know i think about you know the title and you know how you know for me i i in the in the story arc i automatically go back and you know think of the personal experience that you've gone through and and in the industry and it seems like this is some kind of a freedom right now for you where you're not you know caught in the machine anymore really i'm i'm just having fun amen i i you know for for a, for a period of time i was doing something that was fun 45% of the time and the other 55% wasn't very fun. And so in the majority of something that you're doing that you're choosing to do, you have the choice whether or not you do this particular thing. If you're forcing yourself to do something that you don't have to do and you're not having any fun with it at all and it's causing you stress and you're losing your hair, literally, <laughs> I gained wisdom, but I lost like, you know, an inch on my hairline um, uh, from the front and the back. Uh, <laughs> they're coming from all sides. Oh. I got to defend the throne. Uh, uh. And really, I just found something that I could really sink my teeth into and really um really push myself and that to me is like the most fun i haven't made an album like this before i haven't challenged myself at this level to not only write i've written full albums myself but they're more chord based they're not riff based they're not you know i can i can just kind of write about anything and this i'm trying to keep it within as i call it the realm that i've created this particular realm and you know and considering things as as someone would do if they're writing a movie or writing a book of okay if if i write this and release it this is canon so if i make a sequel to this album i'm going to have to take all these things into consideration and all these things into account but it's at the end of the day, it's just fun. I'm just having fun. I'm not taking this too seriously, but I am able to, you know, put my own emotions into it. The Beast Awakens is my awakening in this sense of me being like, you know what? 10 years ago, I said, give metal a chance on American Idol. 10 years ago, almost. By the time the album comes out, it'll have almost been 10 years uh, in the same year space of the 10 years since. And it's taken me 10 years to finally myself give metal a chance um, for me and and for my fans and new fans. And uh, that's that's real important. Well, from what I've seen in some of the comments uh, on uh, some of the videos, uh, you've really begun to ingratiate yourself to the hardcore metal audience. I got one more for you, if you don't mind, and then uh, I'll let you go because I know you're busy with uh, uh, with the release uh, and everything like that. So uh, I want to ask you, uh, with everything going on still with COVID, uh, any plans of doing any kind of streaming concert or anything like that or anything else live? Or what do you have in the works? Not currently. I, I feel like until we're able to really do this thing right live, um, this will be a studio album. Okay. And I, I really want to... Um, I really, really freaking want to get out there uh, and play. My bass player's in Texas. My drummer's like 45 minutes from here. One of my guitar players is also in Texas. So, you know, this was an album that was made long distance, um, but that's where, you know, some of the most important pieces are. And the first time it's played, I want to play it with the people that contributed to it, that made it what it is. You know, I may have written every song and every lyric and every note, but I'm um, the feel and what, you know, what Mike Vanderheel did on the drums and, you know, harkens back to that, um, that Jimmy Bain, that uh, mm -hmm. um, Vinny Apice yeah. kind of, kind of feel 
um, you know, still that John Bonham kind of thing. And and then what Barry Sparks did on bass completely took these songs to entirely new heights. And, you know, if if these aren't the guys playing on these songs, the first time that we get to play it live, our inaugural, you know, our maiden voyage, if you will, um, then, you know, I don't feel like it should be uh, played until we get those guys in on it and and you know who's to say what it uh, ends up being after that if it's them if it's other guys but for the maiden voyage it should be the guys that uh that contributed the most and i'd love to do some i don't know some kick-ass stage show and and once if if touring is still at a standstill but things start to open up again where i can bring guys in and and set something up at a local theater here and in santa cruz and uh and film something and put together like a cool performance video with you know some inflatable dragon and a glowing a orb with my face dragon. on it and dude i've got it all right here I mean, we can do stop motion right here we got this <laughs> little dragon and like in the kings before you one take performance i got my little dragon here i got my sword i got my big tapestry dragon over here yeah, just give them the right measurements right we don't yeah, want to yeah. we don't yeah, we, we don't want we don't want stone uh, yeah. <laughs> i know right <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll put the crystal we'll we'll uh what do they do that it's like a uh i forget what it's called but they do it in all the all the movies and, and Elf and Lord of the Rings and stuff. And, and uh, you know, they put the, the bigger character further back, but they like cut the table in a way to where they film it. It looks like they're sitting across the table from each other. We'll do stuff like that. Cool. James, thank you so much and take care of yourself, brother. Thank you. You too. Okay. Out of the family for me. We'll do. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. This is James Durbin of the band Durbin, and you are getting your metal fixation on 99 WNRR.